Spatchcock Nation is in the house. Unfiltered, uncensored, and unapologetically for the people. Turn it up. After a long day at work, sometimes there ain't nothing better than sipping on some good old bourbon, particularly with people you want to hang out with. One of my favorite people in the world to sip alcohol with, and I guess sip anything, man, whether it's Kool-Aid, grape juice, milkshakes, is my partner in crime, number 24 in your programs, and number one in your hearts, Alexander DeRosa. You know what's funny is, uh, yes, you, you are one of my favorite people to sip something with um coffee in the morning you know you you're not a coffee guy but tea um but not but i'm not a bourbon fan i've tried really really hard to be a bourbon fan or a whiskey fan um i've went to the parties i've swished it around in my mouth i've done all the things with an ice cube and it, i'm not there yet. Me then that you decided to produce a tv show where one of the episodes is about a bourbon club yeah no same and i will say it was one of the most fun episodes to shoot it was, it was, it was super fun. And the bourbons were very good and the bourbons were flowing. But I, I know that you had a few bourbons though, because I saw you drinking one of them. No, I did. I did have a few. Um, but I, again, I, it's like, I, you know what I've noticed though? I try to drink it too quick. I'm like, oh, you know, like anything, I, I can't hold it in my hand and not drink it. It's when yeah. the ice cube melts is it gets good. And I've right. never given it that much time. And I think that's the key. So you could go with a bourbon and water too. That's a good beginner entry, entry way to do it. But I'm not going to shame people that don't like certain types of booze because when, when I was in high school um, and my friends started drinking and I didn't start drinking at, at the same speed that they did. You waited until um, you were 21? I'm not, no, I didn't. But ironically, until I now I'm a now I'm a heavy drinker. But in high school, they're drinking a little bit ahead of me. So we were at a party once and I was drinking a beer but pouring it out when I wasn't drinking it. And um, they were teasing about that and everything. So I don't want to shame someone for not doing it, but you could try it with some water. Wait, you, you know, were you were pouring the beer out because you didn't like the taste of it? Well, I didn't really. I don't think I wanted to get. I don't remember if I didn't want to get drunk or whatever it was. At one of these parties, so I would like drink it, but I was pouring it out when people weren't looking. I've done that with shots, yeah. just because like I don't want a shot at the moment, and it's like this. Or, or you bought me shots before, but you got yourself a shot of water, and I'm like, it's like a really water. shitty thing to do. But I'm like, you know what? Like, yeah. I care about my morning a lot. The next morning, who cares, who cares about people's money when it's just you know whatever, man? And for someone that doesn't get hung over like yourself, you don't have to worry about that. But my like, if I take shots. The next morning, I'm gonna feel awful. And, and well, now, and that early in life, whatever, I can figure it out. Now there's a child like bouncing on my head, or waking me up, and they always get up extra early when you're hungover. Well, you know what though? In that case, if you're waking up hungover and they're bouncing and running around, give them some bourbon. It'll it'll slow things down. You know what I mean? Boozy whipped cream. <laughs> yeah, boozy whipped cream, dude. That's how it goes. So speaking of boozing and great people to party with. Our guest tonight for the 100 Proof People After Party was one of the stars of the episode itself and one of the funniest people that we know, super creative. This person has worked for advertising agencies. She has done triathlons. She has been a, a prolific writer. She's a great creator. She's a leader in industry and super dope person to hang out with, knows her way around a bottle of bourbon, knows her way around an edible or two, and one of the people that you just want to eat up, man, because she's just super cool. Our great and dear friend, the one and only Lisa Dolbear. <laughs> that was quite the intro. Did you man, like I'm, that at the end there? Just someone you want to eat up? I mean, that was, you know. I mean, eat me. You can eat me. <laughs> take it take it off the cuff. You know what I mean? Man, I just learned something about you. I did not know that you didn't drink coffee. What is that about? I, I only drink, um, I like coffee flavor on like a steak or like the smell of it, but I only drink like... um iced tea i mean i've got so many other vices and so many other like crippling addictions that probably coffee is not gonna and you don't really need the caffeine i feel like in the morning you're like ready to go <laughs> i you know I, I thanks alex man that makes me feel i don't good. know if that was a compliment i think that just it's, was a fact it's, it's the cocaine i do when i when i get up right out of bed so then you're ready to go you know what i mean that, that's I, uh, you no, know, he, I mean, he doesn't you know what you, but you you don't even try like some people that don't like coffee they'll go for like the extra like sweet stuff you don't yeah. even you don't even partake in that well you're sweet enough i just have you dip your finger in my tea and then i'm good to oh go yeah there I we go you like, did you just say teabagging did i hear teabagging oh shit she's back I baby that. i didn't hear that <laughs> it's so fun sorry i love yeah. it i love okay. it i love it 
So here's the deal, man. Like we, you, like besides, we're gonna go through all of your shit about you being an awesome stand-up comedian, and we're gonna talk about your bourbon jersey, your jersey. Well, bourbon jersey. Alex, by the way, Alex is very proud of his jersey in the back. Do you notice it has his name on it? Over oh, I didn't even notice. I didn't even notice it there. Oh, that old thing back there. You didn't notice that with your yeah, big yeah. Yeah. He's it's placing a chair in between his Emmy and a jersey with his own name on it. Look yeah, at you. Yeah. Look at this guy. Like oh, a wrestling this, oh, belt too back oh, there. Is it there? is a wrestling belt. I, I want it. It was given to me as a, uh, you know, a prize for winning a championship match. So, All I just right, kept it. Alex. Yeah. Learning I, some did you know that I used to be a backyard wrestler before the PBS days? I was uh, on public access in seventh or eighth grade as a backyard wrestler. I did not know that. Now we're going to have different interactions moving forward from this, I believe. Why are you, are you a backyard wrestling fan? No, but I'm scrappy as hell and grew up in the farm country, uh, made a name Barnes. What does that tell you? And uh, I'm good at kickboxing. I, I'll take a shot at kicking your ass. How about we do oh. it edible and see how, how oh, it plays out? This was professional wrestling, like stage stuff. It wasn't like UFC fighting. Are you saying I can't beat you? No, no, no. I'm saying you can beat me. I, I was on a uh, trampoline. Like it was a trampoline wrestling. We had three trampolines and we'd wrestle on trampolines. So like it wasn't super like uh, badass. We did hit each other with chairs and, and cookie sheets. That sounds like um, your mother, I hope, had great medical insurance. She was not happy with any of it. She actually came home one night and, and I told her like, oh, we'll be done. It's just we're just messing around. And one of our friends who came into town, they, they did this themselves. And um, he would lit the other dude on fire. He lit thumbtacks on fire on a board and he body slammed the other guy on it. And and we didn't know he was going to do that. We kind of knew he was going to do something cool. Like they did crazier shit than we did. We just like bounced around and like did shit. So she walked in. She walked into the kitchen and looked out the window right as that was happening. He jumped off the deck and then he body slammed him. And she <laughs> he didn't shut it down in that moment. But she said, never again are you allowed to do this. Which what, age, what age were these children doing this? So I was in like eighth, seventh grade maybe. And so they were in like ninth grade. Yeah, gosh. So my son Emmett is getting up into this range of age now, and I can see, I can see these moments coming my way. And I'm trying to gauge right now, like, what kind of mom are you going to be? Like the mom that gets in there and is like, you can't do anything that's remotely dangerous, or am I just going to like let it rip? But like, I, then something horrible happens, and I'm like, I oh my god, you'll be in the middle. You'll like, you know. Yeah, I, I think you might be the the mom that like if they're back at wrestling, you come out and get tagged in and then start wailing on some kid. You know what I mean? Hey, depending like on the kid, not the mom. I might take my chance. I might shoot my shot. You know what I'm saying? Or, or like, or like if you see him doing something, they're like, "Mom's gone." And all of a sudden, you 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 appear in the entrance way, like like Undertaker, and they're like, "Oh shit!" Already entrance music. I think I'm like the bitchy mom of the neighborhood already just because like our backyard is awesome. As you guys know, it's, it's amazing back there. It's like the childhood dream Creek woods got everything right here and nestled in this little suburbia. So I let people go back there. Like they go back, they play, they have a great time. I'm not like out there supervising it. Like I've, you know, I, I listen, I can hear if there's like a traumatic 911 scream, but Otherwise, I like let it go. And like sometimes Emmett comes in and he's like, oh my God. And he's like telling me all these things that are going down back there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, should I go back there? Should I go back there and like manage that? Or is that like just normal? What kind of like, things are going down? You know, there's like headlocks and just swearing. And like, and I'm like, this swearing is, sounds, is swearing this is probably sounds like me hanging out with my cousins on Easter is what it sounds like to me. But yeah, and you, you know, don't swear I, at all. So that's, it's probably not heard in the household. I don't I'm think trying to. You're not the bitchy mom. I mean, I think, well, I mean, maybe with the kids you are, but like for the neighborhood, you're like the, the cool neighbor because you throw bangers at your cool house. People love hanging out there. Um, like, especially at Bourbon Night, where I'll be like, it'll be Bourbon Club and I'm like, cool. I'm like, I'm just going to go have one drink at eight o'clock. And then at like one in the morning, I'm like stumbling into an Uber and almost got in the wrong Uber once. Yeah. We, um, we're like, we try to have people over for a happy hour and we try to be like, it's like, you know, at four o'clock and then at five 30, like you should go. And uh, that never works. It never works when we are invited to that occasion and it never works when people are here. And I remember 
a bunch of people coming over from the neighborhood and we were just going to have like a happy hour party to thank all the neighbors who were cool. Like when those shitty neighbors were calling the cops on us all the time. Yeah. And it ended up all of our cool neighbors were here and all of the kids were playing out back in the Creek and the thing. And we were like, all of us collectively were like, we need to feed these children. And we ordered like 20 happy meals or something. There's a picture on my Instagram of like happy meal toys lined up like 20 of them in a row, like on the table, because like, that's the kind of, parents we were that night it's just everyone's getting a happy meal and it was just cool they, like it? they probably loved it i mean everybody liked it nobody it was like that perfect like nobody expected the night to go that way i think people were rolling out of here at like 9 30 10 it was probably a week night you know we we had the best intentions of having a nice respectable have a drink we love you come let us appreciate you party and it just always turns into a banger like almost every time so uh, so that's why you're yeah. awesome and also i mean i could eat a happy meal right now i mean that sounds like a really good deal yeah so what he, he, what bourbon are you drinking right now like what's your go-to what's your choice right now okay well you know the collection we have so i don't have a go-to necessarily i try to experience everything that my husband's amassing uh right now i have bull run it is a pick that the Syracuse Bourbon Society, which my husband Chris is a part of too, they go and they do picks, especially for the club. And um, this one happens to be, uh, it's like 124 proof. It was uh, aged in sherry barrels after it was like made. And when I first tasted it, I thought it was like a 90 proofer. It's like super smooth and super nice. When Chris wow. told me it was like 124 proof, I was like, no way, but it's like, so smooth and so i just i like the big kick that you get out of it but i like the smooth flavor because sometimes like the lower proof your 80s and stuff like that like for me they're good but they they border on like too sweet or something for me like it's too i like the kick in the ass a little bit i don't want to be like impaired by it right in, in in terms of like a burning throat and all of that but i like a little a little something well, you know yeah. so i we talked about this at bourbon night, but I'm not a bourbon drinker and I want to be, and neither were you. So I, I need some advice. What should I do if I want to start being cool and drink bourbon and talk bourbon and, and talk whiskey? I don't like the kick in the throat either. I like the smooth. Were you just Honestly, talking about wrestling on flaming, flaming? No, I like, I like a, I like a yes. fake stage kick in the throat at a professional okay. wrestling match. But. I want to stage kick you in the throat right now after that comment. <laughs> right, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, for me, like I was the same way. Like I don't, I always like a drink that's like pleasant. Like I don't want to feel like I'm being punished by putting something in my mouth. Um, and so I went to Hawaii a few years ago with our friends, the Rooks, who are in the episode, also big bourbon drinkers, and my husband. And awesome. we, we, went to, we went to a whiskey bar, and everyone was having like fancy drinks. And I was like, you know, well. I don't want to just have my normal glass of Chardonnay. Like I wanted something else. And so they, they had me try a bourbon smash and I was reluctant because I had the word bourbon in it. Cause I immediately go to like Brown stinging liquor. Right. But the bourbon smash, you know, it's a muddled mint lemon. It's got a simple syrup. It's got the ice in there. It really is so nice. It's like kind of like how the mule brought some of the liquors that people are scared of forward. Like that's also what the bourbon smash did. And so I, I got like, into that bourbon smash and when we came home we were like ordering all the ingredients i was making bourbon smashes all the time and then i started to think you know i, I want to taste the bourbon a little bit more it's really getting too sweet for me and this is around the time when i stopped putting sugar in my coffee we were like me and chris were fasting so i was drinking just black coffee so i kind of got used to like stronger flavors that were like maybe not as um enjoyable at first because our palates are so used to like super salty or super sweet and so I started to like appreciate the flavor of the bourbon, different proofs and different, you know, ways of, of aging it and whatnot. And it, it just started there. Like I, I had to have it the way that it was going to be palatable for me at first, which was to make it sweeter and mix it with citrus. And then slowly I started to go, then it was just ice and the bourbon. Um, and then it was just neat. Now, I mean, this is literally just the bourbon from the bottle to the glass. And like, I appreciate the experience of sipping it feeling of how it coats your mouth, enjoying the different like notes and tones that come out from the smell to the taste, to the burn, to the like, just pleasing feeling that you have. And like, you're not going to get that circle. from your bourbon smash. Yeah, no, I, you've come full circle on this. I have, I and love. no one ever, no one saw that coming less than me. <laughs> Trust I me. love, I like a good bourbon smash. One of our first cocktail recipes we made on the show was the blackberry bourbon smash. Is that what we called it? Blackberry 
And yeah. that was an awesome drink. So I would drink that. The problem that I have also, I don't like super sweet drinks. Like if I have a super, like a sweet-ish cocktail, like one of them, and then I'm done. But yeah. like, so I feel like if I tried that route, I would, I would eventually want less sugar in it and less like berries and all that shit. So maybe, maybe that's, maybe bourbon smash is my new beverage I'm going to order. I think it's a good, it's a good it's a good starter one. And like right now, so I've been, um, I haven't, I don't, my go-to typical drink most of the time is tequila, tequila soda. Um, but I do enjoy bourbon. And lately I, the last couple of bourbons I had were bullets because I've been watching Yellowstone and they drink bullet on there and I want to hang out. Is that why you have the cowboy hat at your house too? Exactly. Um, but our friend Laura survey gave us, um, these custom bottles of makers mark with like our names on them dedicated to us. So Alex has one and I have one. And it's one of those things where like people give you some bottles and I like Maker's Mark, but now that it has like our name written on it, I don't think I'll ever open it. Like someone gave my wife this cool bottle of Tito's that like has her name on it. Um, but I also wonder if like at your houses, as your kids are growing up, you might have a bottle like that. Like, like Amelia, when she's like 17, might see the Alex Derosa bottle on a <laughs> shelf and you might be like, oh, cool. And she knows you're never going to drink it. So she might find a way to get the top off replace it with stuff you know do you Dude, think that we, used to, we used to do that at our friend's house mike mike bush uh his, his parents had a sick bar in the basement and we would slowly drink them like they'd have so much of it that we'd just like take a little bit of this a little bit of this and we'd fill it i mean it's easy to replace uh but yeah, well, yeah no no replace with water and other things and at one point like the mom comes home and she goes i could like like lisa dolber comes home I'm like man i could really use a glass of bur bourbon and she's like it tastes like flat Coca Cola. What the hell is this shit? Then yeah. all over Your the house. kids are gonna start doing that. You guys have so much bourbon in there that bourbon, oh, yeah. and then there's the brownies in the freezer, which I told them of. these are like bourbon brownies. You shan't have them. <laughs> they Ooh. know my kids are not stupid. I wasn't stupid at their age. I'm not gonna pretend that they're stupid at their age. Like we're just very honest with the children about. There's things that mommy and daddy have and there's things that you don't have. And like, that's a boundary you have to respect. And if you don't, and I find out about it, that's not going to be a great day for you. So that's now let me ask you this. I'm at, I'm at Kitty Hoynes or somewhere and I'm like, Hey, can I, and I try to be like, Oh, can I get a bourbon smash? And they're like, hoping that that's the end of the conversation. And they say what, and they ask me some questions like what bourbon do you want? What am I picking? You're going to say Buffalo Trace, Eagle Rare, Makers is pretty much what everyone has. Makers is a great bourbon. It's it's okay. like so baseline. Like if you're offended by Makers, it's because you're a snob. It's There's nothing wrong with it. It's a great, affordable, accessible bourbon. It's never going to be one of those ones where you have to like know someone who knows someone to go get it in some back alley. Makers is great. Um you know, and, and when you're mixing it with stuff, like the uh, the amount of ingredients that are in a bourbon smash to like a true bourbon drinker, it really doesn't matter what you put in there. Um, my dad always says the best Manhattans are from the shittiest, cheapest bourbons. And he would put like some whatever swill in there and be happy with his, you know, the neon red maraschino cherry. Like he looks at our like blood red, like dark, like Luxato cherries. And he's just like, what yeah. is that? <laughs> it's just yeah. like. Sorry, we're elevating it. You know, we're for millennials. I just called myself a millennial, and I'm firmly Gen X. So apologies for that. Yeah, I, when, when people, millennial. Yeah, when I get called a millennial, I'm like, oh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Right? I'm, I'm like, a, thank you. I'm on the border of a millennial. I'm like the the, the high end. So. So wait, what, what year were you born? 1985. God, you freaking youngin. You both are. Man, what are you? You're younger than me, right? Uh no, I'm way. Old. I'm was born in '77. Okay, well, two years. I'm 79. We won't tell you how old Matt is, but we'll give you a clue. He's old enough to get a colonoscopy. Yeah, I'm getting colonoscopy. Ooh, did you get it? No, it's first wrong. one. Okay, yeah. okay, Chris. Chris well, would kill me. Well, I'm not going to over share. First Chris one. First not... one for medical reasons. I've I've had some for pleasurable reasons, but this is the first oh, one. Jesus. I'm going to be under for it. You know what I mean? Chris just had his first like. You should do this now. It is your time to do this one. Yeah. I guess that's yeah. medical. Yeah. But. Like it was great. I passed it with flying colors, but like he, like the prep for it. I don't know if you've looked into what that involves. That is I'm, not fun. I've been prepping all day. Like it's like um, I've been. I haven't eaten anything. I I I, I right. drank bone broth after the. I, I went to the gym this morning. I've been tired. Now I'm cranky, and I'm I'm dealing with two assholes on a podcast. I'm like, oh my god, what's this going to be like? Good choice of profanity. 
Yeah. So, you know, you had a good choice of word earlier when you said Shan, because you have a gift with, with, with a lot of shit, but you also have a gift of being fun to hang out with, but choosing good people to hang out with. So describe for us the ideal drinking buddy. I mean, your husband is an awesome dude to drink with. Alex is, but in general, like what should people look for if they want to find a good drinking buddy? Not a snob. Um, so I guess you could say open-minded, same it. thing. Um, somebody who tends to kind of overshare once they start having a drink or two. To me, the most, the, the, to me, the, my favorite thing about having a drink or meeting someone with a drink is like all the like um, pomp and circumstance like goes away a little bit and you get to really see somebody like a little bit raw, like let's exfoliate you of your bullshit and like really talk to you and like really hear some things that you really think about some off topics. And like, so for me, like if you get around a person who can have a drink or two and start to shed some of that light to me, that's so exciting. Cause like, I just like love to get to know people for real. And like, I love to laugh wholesomely and for real. And for me, that doesn't happen very often. It has to be in moments where people feel like they're not vulnerable. They're not like being judged. They're not responsible for anything. And like, you know, obviously alcohol helps with all of those elements. So I like to be around people who are okay with like letting go a little bit and like getting a little crazy and going off the beaten path. Like we don't got to go rob a bank or kill anyone, but like, let's just talk about some things that are a little weird. I don't know. Why not? Yeah. I mean, that's, you coined that term liquid charisma, which I love so much. And I like that you're talking about when you spill the bourbon, you spill the tea. So now I, I want to segue into um, really about you as a person and a creative cat. So I talked before, like you and I have worked together and um, I, I think about like this really cool idea you had for Remington razors about like, um, how to get them to get dudes that were interested in it, like picking women they liked and they would assign their facial hair ideas to them and other cool shit you've done. You've done stand-up comedy and you were awesome at it because I was there. So tell us about like your willingness to just get the fuck out there and be like, okay, here I am. Like you're a trainer. You like you lead roomfuls of people on bikes and spinning and all sort of shit. Tell us how you kind of just have that charisma even without the liquid. You know what I mean? Tell us about you. Um, I just... I just take off the mask. Like I don't, at first it's scary. The scariness of like totally exposing yourself for who you are in a moment, in any given moment, I'm different on a spin class than I am in a pitch than I am having a drink with a new person. Um, taking off the mask at first is like, holy shit, but it's sort of like a cold plunge where it's like, yeah, that water's going to be cold. And at first it's like uncomfortable, but then it's like rewarding in a way that nothing else gives you that reward. And so I just think that if it feels like you're being raw in front of somebody and you're exposing something in front of somebody, to me, I always take, I always will take that path because I, I get so much out of it and it's scary every time you approach it. It doesn't matter how many times you approach that path and how many times you put your hand on the mask and start to pull down and rethink if you're doing the right thing. Every time you do it, there's something on the other side of that that is like the best fucking thing. And like, for me now, like talking about being a spinning instructor and being in front of people, I teach multiple classes all the time. I mean, uh, most of the people at the gym who have been there for a long time know me as somebody who like dominated in triathlon, marathons, Ironman. I wrote for Ironman. I coached Ironman athletes. I, I was in it like before kids. I had kids and I made the decision to like not spend time on that. Um, I still spend a lot of time teaching classes, but my body is very different than it was then. I have boobs now I have curves now I have you know I have a belly like I'm like you know hey this is not at 45 you're not gonna party like I party and look like I did when I did Iron Man at 25 okay so I routinely get asked or people make statements to me about I'm pregnant or I just had a baby because I have a bit of a belly and it's like uh, at first it was really hard for me because I was I, you know I'm not like any other woman and I'm like you know just fuck, like someone's actually calling me out on like what my body looks like. And they're actually, to them, I, I'm trying to reverse engineer to thinking like to them, they must, they think they deduce that like the only way that that person who works out like that and has that kind of like approach to working out and training, the only way she would have that kind of curve in her stomach is because she's pregnant or just had a baby. And I'm like, no, dude, like I spent like more than 10 years of my life doing that kind of lifestyle and living that life. Like, I had kids at two C-sections, 18 months apart. Like 
this is the body I have now. And guess what? It can go hard. And so now it's like, I had this guy next, to me. this is my favorite story of, of late, about a month ago, a guy at this boot camp where we're doing, you know, air bike, kettlebell, all kinds of crazy shit. And he comes up to me and he goes, you're my little inspo. He calls me little inspo is my nickname to him. And he's like, all I know is that if you can do all this while you're pregnant, I should do it too. And I was like, oh my God. I'm like, sir, I'm like, are you pregnant? That's like what I said to him. Like, are you pregnant? Cause I'm done. I'm done making apologies. I'm done. You know, like that mask is off now. And honestly, like, please come at me. Like you see my gut out and I'm like giving it my all, please come at me. Like I, I'm not what here to apologize hell? anymore. It, it, this is real, this is real shit that happens to me all the time. All the time. So that, that story, that story is, is both funny and it's a little bit unbelievable. I mean, we were partying with you uh, two weeks ago now. Right. And then a little bit before that, and I, I would never ever even think that um, at all. And I also remember at Stephanie's party of that fucking dope, like, um, sparkly shit on, which looks super cool. So I, I don't know why people would say that, but you, like your way that you go through life, you're very self-aware, but you also kind of don't give a fuck. And I know that you probably, like all of us deal with imposter syndrome, but like, um, I can just listen to you tell stories and shit like that too. So tell us a funny story about you in a bourbon adventure and, or about some dude being sketchy like that too. Um, but I also like your rap nickname, Lil Inspo too. So that's going to stick. <laughs> well, Inspo. I don't know. I, I, I guess the funniest stories I have lately are like when I, I get hit on a lot, like when I'm traveling for work or when I'm around and like, it's surprising to me. Cause I'm just, my brain is not in that mode anymore. Like I'm happily married. I have a family. Like I'm, my body went to a place that's not like, if I was like out there, like trying, I might handle this differently, but like, I, I don't need to, I'm fine. but people will hit on me sometimes. And I'm just like, when I like realize like some dudes like flirting with me and I'm just being like completely like not, I don't know, like this guy was like, Hey, like, it feels like we could like take this workout like to the next level. And I'm like, oh do you want to go on the erg for five more minutes? And he's like, no, cause I don't wear my rings when I work out either. So like people don't, I guess, realize all the time. But, or when you travel apparently either, I'm sure Kristen <laughs> loves that. I don't get it as much when I'm traveling or when I, it, or it's just like creepy work travel people who are like I, I don't know i feel like there's like a class of people who when they travel for work are like what happens on my work trip today's my work trip and I'm like that's not me but like in the gym i'm like usually like no rings no anything i don't talk about anything i just like there to like kill it yeah like i get hit on a lot but have you mixed your comedy routine with your like spin class routine like if, or have you ever brought it into that um yeah i mean jesus i'm on a stage with a microphone like if that's that's always gonna bring out that the, could be like its own like youtube channel or like tiktok channel yeah my i mean if you you can ask my classes like anyone i could pull anyone that comes to my class on a regular basis and they would be like yeah so she's definitely i definitely swear i definitely say inappropriate things i definitely lots of innuendo I, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth when I'm working out because again, <laughs> when I'm working out, I go hard. And when you go hard in a physical way, you tend to get like raw, the mask is off. Right. So yeah. when the mask is off, the filters off for me. And like, that's one and the same. So you get what you get and I'm sorry, but like, not sorry, I guess. I want to know what you're like at office Christmas parties. Is, is that, that's when the mask <laughs> comes off and everyone's like, Oh shit. Like, can't believe what happened. It's really funny. Cause, um, Obviously, Matt knows I worked at Mellor for a long time and I came up there and they were everyone like family to me there. So like there I could kind of I don't know if Stephanie's probably gonna be like, God damn, Lisa Tobear. But like I felt like I could get away with a lot there. Like I could be myself there and it would be like I became one of those like characters of like the lore of Mower. It's like I could get away with shit. Then I started working in another company where I didn't have that like backlog of a decade's worth of that's just who Lisa is. And um, I actually had a, a boss early in my career at my new job who actually said to me, like, you're in a position now where you shouldn't swear because, you know, you're it just makes blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't know of an advertising or marketing or creative industry position where swearing is not just like part of the job. I just for like, yeah, like, swearing, like it's not you're not children. Like, why, why can't people swear? I've always felt that way. I came up though working on, you know, 
I came from a farming family. I worked in con I, my dad had a business. I worked with contractors all of my life through college. Like you wear dickies, you swear, you get the shit done, you go home. That's, I, you know, just, that's the good swear model. thing drives me that that cracks me up because I think about um you make me think of I, telling you not to swear, I think was only going to make it worse. Like there's a story about um, Kid Rock, who now is devolved into whoever, whatever the hell he is now. But he was supposed to play at the, or he did play at the New York Fair, the New York State Fair. And the grandstand when they were doing the contract, because I was, I had been working on the account that managed that at the time. And um, when they signed the contract with Kid Rock, this great guy who passed away, his name was Joe LaGuardia. They called him the music man. He booked all the musical acts told me the story about they were negotiating and where the grandstand was, the end of the stands spill out into like neighborhoods of, of Solvay in that part of Syracuse. So you can hear the music. And um, they said to the agent or the booking agent they're like, that worked for, for Kid Rock, they're like, hey, so just so you know, um, yeah, we'll agree to the concert. Cause I mean, he was a big star at the time, a lot of money, but we'd like to see if you could ask him to cut down on the swearing. And uh, cause there's families <laughs> around there. And the agent was like, I won't ask him. I mean, I will. If you want me to ask him, I guarantee you he will swear way more. So I'm just picturing like a boss telling, telling you that and be like, yo, do you know who you're talking to? Because I mean, you're, you're hilarious and it adds so much color to the way that you tell such awesome stories. It was just that she, you know, that was a whole thing. But like to get back to the original question of like, what's it like when there's an office party and I'm involved? It is a conversation that Chris and I have before every party we go to of can you just consider maybe not getting to certain levels of you? And I know what those levels are and you've hung out with me enough to probably know what they are too. Um, they're not, saying. it's not, not swearing. It has to do with like keeping your clothes on, not making um, political kind of sorts of comments, but like, it's funny because the company I work for now, I went to one of their like big Christmas party things. And it was like at this casino that was like rented out this whole like dance thing. And, and um, I was his plus one to that. I hadn't even considered working there at the time. I was just going along purely for the fun of dancing my ass off in a casino and having a, a venue that would accept the multitude of sparkles I wanted to wear. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> What I remember from that night is I dented the shit out of like one of my favorite rings. I have no idea to this day, looking at the ring, I don't know how my finger's not broken. I, first of all, I don't know how the ring came off of my body. It's like literally, it had dent like a bumper in a car crash. And I'm like, I don't know how that happened. A, I don't know how it came off my body and my finger did not. I don't know what happened that night, but I had a great time. And I know I work for that company now. Um, <laughs> and I guess, so I guess it's fine. I guess the way I act at a holiday party is fine. Well, you know what? Like I've worked for companies with awesome holiday parties mm -hmm. and a lot of fun and high bar bills. And then I've worked for, uh, I won't mention uh, the university, but universities that don't have any parties and alcohol is not included. And it's just the opposite. So I'd rather have the extreme by far than like, because that's what honestly, like when you don't get to, hang out at that level with people you don't actually get to like know them very well it's not just yeah. drinking it's just like doing more than just like oh oh shit we had lunch together and it was like a casual lunch like the the extra is what makes everyone so close i love it i mean i love for me drinking with people is what a favorite pastime i don't know if that's like an alcoholic statement or what but like anytime i can get together and break bread with my people, whether I work with them a little or a lot, or I don't work with them, but I see them on occasion. Like it is always like, it just exponentially deepens the relationship in whatever capacity that relationship was in after. I, I agree that, that whether you're drinking or not too, because I've worked with people and gotten close to people that don't drink at all. Like um, Alex and I have both worked with Jeff Canales and you know, Jeff and Jeff doesn't yeah. drink, and, but I've gone on a lot of road trips, spent a lot of time with him and it's just, when you're outside of the office, you get to know people. But like you said, a shared meal, anything that can bring people together. But I, I also think, though, that part of that, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted you on the show and in our show that we shot, is some people add the right chemistry to groups. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think I, I've traveled with Alex. I've been to places with you. I think there are certain people that you're like, 
fuck it. We're going to go to like, we're going to go to some weird ass place in the middle of nowhere. And somehow like two hours later, you're finding some locals and having a good time. And I think that people add that chemistry to it, but it's that willingness to kind of get weird. So w- w- tell us like a, a story where you ended up like traveling or doing something else and some weird shit happened, but like in a beautifully awesome, weird way. <laughs> okay. Um, gosh. <sighs> um, I'm trying to think about some of the, it's, it would definitely be like a work trip. It would definitely be like, I went to Atlanta a lot when I was working for Mower. I would go down there a lot for um, just different clients. And I remember a meal with the guy that owned the office down there at the time. And like, he was very like, you know, tie collar. And like, I was very like, okay, like I know this guy and I know he likes me and appreciates the work that I do, but I don't know that he is ready for like, unmasked lisa (laughs) it's like it was not even a glass and a half of chardonnay later that we were like completely talking about like first time we like got laid and like talking to just i mean it was like literally like the kinds of like every topic you're not supposed to talk about with like people from work was covered after 45 minutes broad daylight a block from the office with this man who drives a Mercedes, who's like totally like out of, you know, like we're not, we're from different cloths, except for we both work for this company. And like, we were like the best of friends by the end of it. And I still talk to him today and he doesn't work there either anymore. But um, and I bet your work guy. interactions were like 10 times better because you're like kind of, even though you're not friends, friends, you're like, you're closer. Right. And like little things that work aren't is I, I remember people that I would work with that like their emails would just be like a trigger. I'm like, oh my God, they're so, but then when I, when I did something with them outside of work, um, it stopped altogether because I'm like, I actually like this person and they're actually like a cool person outside of here. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Like at this point, like it's weird because I used to travel all the time before COVID I've traveled, I mean, multiple times a month for work and it was like, great. You know, you always like, oh, should I have to travel? But like, Matt knows. I mean, you and I traveled before, but like being on the road to go pitch things was like being in this like small special circus. And it was like freaking awesome. It would be like everyone's crazy and fucked up before the thing. And we're like, oh, my God, we're going to do this. And there's nerves and you do it. Then and then everyone's still crazy and fucked up on the other side of it. But it's like this different energy. It's like we did it. It was fine. Like we're if it went well, then forget it. Like everyone's hammered in like half an hour after that. Um, (laughs) It was great. And so like, I, you know, I don't have those moments as much now in my role in my, cause I joined a new company while in COVID. So like, I've only had a couple of those like in-person moments and that's, that's really interesting for me because I, you know, I had like nearly two decades into in-person shit, drinking, doing, carrying on with people. And now it's like, I see you on zoom. You're in this like two dimensional square and or you're like we're in New York City and it's like we're we're going for it like we're pitching and we're tying it on and it's like those are like two huge extremes and it's like they're more spread out now than they they were before for me so like I don't know I I'm still like testing the waters of like my interactions with work people in person with booze involved because these are not my people I grew up with like at my other company yeah, these are yeah, people, yeah. you know I, I'm a, I gotta have some self awareness about that. That that pitching that pitching um, way you describe that like the traveling circus we are in this own little world with like these confederates that you're that you're rolling with I I absolutely love that and I I was actually um, in Charlotte pitching for something and after we went to this pitch we ended up winning the business and it was a good piece of business and um, we walked out of there knowing like it was going down you know what I mean you know you like like back when you're single you might have seen something across the bar and be like yeah that's going down later it was like that at the end of the at the end of the pitch. So uh, the creative director who was involved with that, who was out of the Charlotte office, um, we're going and we go to have a couple of beers afterwards. Have a couple of beers. He goes, hey, man, um, he gave me the hardest backhanded compliment I may have ever received. He's like, the first couple of times we practiced this over the phone and like met in person and pitched it, I thought you were kind of a douche. But he's like, you know what, man, like the way you pitched that was awesome. He goes, I'll pitch with you anytime. Let's get some more drinks. And I was like, oh, shit, this dude's like basically insulting the shit out of me. Um, but then we had more, more beers by the end. And then I'm like, Oh, I love this guy. And we ended up pitching a bunch of things down the road. So it's, it's weird how it kind of like can unlock your misconceptions about people. I don't know. It was wild. No, totally. And like, I know, I just know there's a bunch of people that think I'm a giant douchebag where I work now. I know they do just, 
for a variety of reasons, just because of the way that we we pivoted, the way that we think about things. And I was like brought in to help them think differently. And, you know, and people don't know me. So I, I'm not like, you know, I mean, look at me right now. You join a Zoom call on a Monday morning at eight o'clock and I have this sweatshirt on and I'm coming at you with this kind of energy. I mean, I'm not swearing or drinking bourbon that you can see. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm a lot for people. And like, I just took that for granted, I think, working where I was before because people just knew that was me. Like, you know, a leopard has its spots. That's Lisa. That's who she is. And like, I think at this, it, you know, it's been, it's been fun. Also a little like, frustrating sometimes for me to figure out how to navigate with people who don't just like accept me for who I am. I mean, they, and they probably do. This is probably more me projecting, but like, I don't know, it's, it's the Zoom life we're in now. It's like hard to read people on a screen and that's mostly where you see them. Well, I, I think though you're good at reading people and you just don't care if they're not going to respect it. And a couple of things that I think about with you. So don't change any of that shit because you're awesome. And one, <laughs> a lion doesn't concern herself with the opinions of sheep. And two, like, uh, a, a leopard or a tiger, like the thing I love about tigers, dude, is tigers cannot change their stripes. If you shave off all their fur, their skin still has the stripes on it. So really, yes, yeah, yeah. And you have you have you, have, have you seen a uh, tiger shaved? I've, I've shaved. No. That's wild. I'm, I'm right. into it. Or like a landing strip tiger. Okay. Oh my god. Uh, all right. Okay. So, um, so that experience that you've had driving, like being brought in to kind of help people see things differently creatively. Um, how do you see the world creatively now? Like where's some cool shit you see in the world? Um, whether it's from your years of doing like incredibly high level athletics, creative stuff, where's the new cool creative shit that you're seeing up on earth? Honestly, you know what the coolest creative shit I can see is that humans are still the most creative fucking thing you're going to find. I, I, I'm, on my profession is a lot of writing. Um, AI is changing the way, this whole industry works, you know, there's whole like sports illustrator just got called out for like literally all of their content was written by AI, including their like authors were like generated by AI. Their photos of these fake people were generated by AI. Like this is a real thing. And um, I, I caught an article the other day that someone had posted on LinkedIn about, let's see if AI could have written this article or this headline. And it was, um, I'm not a sports person, so I, I'm not going to get this right. But it was like the woman who just scored like the most baskets and like it it was Nike and it was like a picture of her with her arms up after I think scoring. And it was like basically like you break it, you own it was the tagline, which is fucking awesome. Tagline. Yeah. Like I don't need to understand a lot about what's going on to understand what that tagline means what that moment in our culture means that it was a woman that it was breaking a record all the things and so this guy ran this experiment and he was like let's see if ai could have written that tagline and so he like it was a long post you had to like stay with it a little bit but he he basically showed you all of the prompts that you would have to put in to help ai get to something as creative and awesome as a human was able to come up with because you break it, you own it is a play on you break it, you bought it. So yeah. AI is not going to get that. You break it, you own it sounds like a bad thing. It's actually a fucking awesome thing because we're talking right. about like changing our culture and the way people perceive things. It went through so many prompts. It's like, write it like you're drunk. Write it like you're a, a, you're a person who smokes weed twice a week but gets A's in like the hardest classes. Like it literally was going through like the most crazy prompts you can think of. And it was like coming up with all this stuff. And it was like ridiculous. It was ridiculous and it couldn't get it succinct enough and it couldn't like hit the culture and the innuendo and the pun that was like there. Like Nike's headline was tight. It was like, okay, you break it, you own it. Like what, four or five words. Like yeah. AI couldn't get it down to like less than seven and it was sounded ridiculous every time. So to me, that says as cool as shit is right now with technology, it is as much as we can do with technology and I appreciate all of it. I use AI a lot to help me get quickly up to speed on different industries or like different companies or whatever. If I have like a meeting in, in a half an hour with a client that I've never like talked to anyone in that industry, AI is my best friend. I can like know the gist of what I should hit on. Yeah. Um, it's never going to replace human artistry or human creativity. And I think the thing I love about that is like humans are here to fucking stay. Okay. Like, robots not going to write that tight headline and like even to the point where i was like was trying to put the name of the athlete in and I'm like no everyone knows 
everyone knows who this athlete is. This headline's going to go with a picture. So don't worry about that. Like this guy was giving the prompt, like every opportunity to not fuck it up. And I couldn't do it. Can do, do you it. Think, do you think that uh, people are just going to get stupider though? Like, accept like boring robotic headlines? Because, like, you ever seen the movie Idiocracy where humans are just like robots and stupid and they just I like, they, it. you know? I don't know, Alex. Like, I don't know. Robots are doing way more now than they ever did when I was a kid. I'm just a spec on the spectrum of what people, I mean, my kid, our kids are not going to experience what robots are going to be capable of when they're ultimately reaching their prime, their yeah. optimist prime. Sorry. Um, I'm just, I just don't think that you're ever like a human is not something that could be recreated. Right. <laughs> That's something like that back there. Created like, I'm sorry. I think having like lungs and a pancreas and a brain and like emotions, like I think those things contribute to creativity and like real change and like real insight. And real like, experiences, not just like factual. So yeah, in the creative that, yeah. In the creative world. So I use I use AI here and there too. And what I've noticed it helps with, and I'm curious on your thought on this, is there's a lot of people in these industries that can't creatively think. And it's just like they're in this industry, they're trying to be creative. They just don't have it in them to like come up with something. Uh, they have to either do a lot of research and then it's just like these flat, basic ideas. I've noticed that with like chat GPT or something, they, it, it, it gets them thought starters. And the hope is like the way I like to use it too, is especially like we're moving around too quick. We're making, we're all like super busy. You get the thought starters out of them and then you take them and make them and add the human element, make them your own. That's uh, it helps people. Yeah. I don't mind a little hamburger helper, right? Like you want a little something to like start it going fine. But like, I guess to use a cooking analogy, which is appropriate for you guys. Um, right, is this a cooking show? Well, like you can make something that comes from a packet, but how you plate it and present it like that, that might be where the human touches that the AI is never going to get to. And like, I just feel like, Humans are also like what people want out of AI and like robots in general, I think is like predictability. Like I can, I know what it's going to do. I told it what I want and I know what it's going to do. A human will hear what you want and it will strive to do what you want to be done, but it might figure out something along the way that's better or different. And like, yeah. I mean, I feel like every like movie and book, like and every like creative expression that's out there is like when there's that like turn of events that came because somebody had like an epiphany or an insight or like something happened. And like, I, do robots get that? I don't know. They hallucinate, which is, means they give you wrong information. That's not the same thing. I think of the rawness that humans experience, right? Like trauma sometimes or adversity or these things that lead to different type of creative ideas work. Um, but I, we once messed around with AI. I had some of my students um, and I wanted to give them a, an exercise that we could like get really aggressive with. So it would be like kind of, um, and make sure there are trigger warnings, but, um, we basically, I'm like, let's pretend we're developing an app that is going to, um, going to be used to help young women, um, move away from being anorexic or other eating disorders. Right. So that was, so we made a creative brief and we had the students work on some, and then the AI work on some, the AI actually got some decent, like things based on information, new prompts kept changing it. But the students actually took some of their prompts and all of a sudden they came up with taglines that were like, and, and by the way, I'm sorry, the app was built, was designed, it doesn't exist, but it was built to like, um, instead of times where you might be thinking about different things or something might trigger you, you go in there and it talks about like different ways to eat healthier or to work out more. So basically to build muscle mass and kind of recondition the person using the app to, to think more about that. So they ended up coming with a tagline called strong is the new skinny. And um, which was clever, the humans versus the computers and the computers like it just couldn't get that because and what it turned out to was one of the women that wrote that in the class um, afterwards, she was like, hey, look, I, you know, um, just to let you know, I'm like, you killed it today, dog. And she's like, yeah, thanks. I, um, you know, I had experienced that when I was younger. So that's kind of where some of that came from. So I think about a lot of the experiences that we have that computers can only learn about from reading other things. They can't really build it the same way from that. Yeah, and, and let's just consider what the AI is scraping and referencing is stuff that's been published, right? It's on the internet. And what people are putting out there, presumably, we're making an assumption, 
is not raw. That's not real. It's been edited. It's been, you know, curated. It's, it's whatever. It's not like a real feeling. So like, it's not that AI could never learn like act like authenticity and like rawness and like primal shit that like we know yeah. as humans that's in our DNA. Like it doesn't have DNA, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Or how like sweat smells or like the different small things. Like there's different things like that, that shouldn't like um, human experiences. Like, I don't know about you two, but the smell of gasoline sometimes I think is a cool smell. Mm-hmm. Diesel, um, diesel gasoline. I love diesel. Yeah. And cut grass. Like there's different things like, that create the, like I remember being in high school playing football and like walking on concrete with the screwing cleats and and smelling the fresh cut grass in the stadium that the, the, that sound and the ASMR experience like that can't be replicated by something else and and truthfully humans can we can write to that you can write something like yeah. I think a lot about like Biggie Smalls one of my favorite rappers of all time being in like in college and listening to him talk about like a gunfight with a Puerto Rican gang like I went to war and with glory in Astoria and listening to me like. Oh, I totally relate to it. Bro, I'm a white kid from the suburbs. I've never been in a gang fight or a gunfight or anything like that. But the way he told that story, I could hear the fire alarm going off in the hotel as he's as he sing that song. So I, I don't think machines can can do that. Well, um, and you hit on an important thing, like storytelling is really about the audience more than it is about the storyteller, right? Like you're sitting around a campfire and telling a story and you're reading the room, the circle around the fire, and like you're you're going to choose different words and like have different like tone of voice or whatever, depending on who's around the circle. Like the AI can't do that. It's not, it can't read that. It wouldn't know what to do with it if it could. Like, it's just everything that's out there about training large language mind, like models and, and getting computers smarter, like until they're like living and breathing and like going through random unpredictable shit day to day, like a human, they're not going to replace a human. So let's talk about training, but we're going to talk about training in one of the areas that you've excelled at, having done multiple triathlons and things like that. Like um, we have a little section here with called Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Boom, hit the music. Uh, no, so we're going to show you the clip, and then we'll, we have a follow-up question with it. So hit it, Susan. Okay, so this clip, as someone that's done this, it, it, it's not funny. It's probably extremely hard to get off that bike. Yeah. I want to know, though, what was one of you? You've done this many times. What was one of your big foul moments that you've done during a triathlon? Either funny or like, oh, shit, like now I, I'm not placing this one. Um, it was my first Ironman in... Lake Placid. I think that was 2008. I, I put it out there that I was going to do it. Like I never pictured myself as a triathlete, let alone one that would do an Ironman. I was always a track runner, like hundred, 200, 400 at the max. I didn't repeat parts of the track was like my thing. And then I got into college and I got in the middle distance running and cross country. And then I got in the marathons and then I don't really know how I got in the triathlon, but I did. And then Eventually, because I am who I am, Iron Man came in my radar and I'm like, I don't know, could I? And like, I get like, the more ridiculous it sounds, the more I'm like, I fucking want to do that so bad. And so I just said I was going to do it. So then everyone was out there. And at the time I was like in my prime at the gym as a spinning instructor and everything else. And so I, I, I did it. I was training for it. And like, everybody can like track you all day, like while you're doing it. And I it was a fucking bad day. It was like monsooning. It was like when you're on the bike and the roads are wet, like if you hit like where the white stripe is, like that's extra slippery. Like there's like a six mile descent or something like that in the beginning of the bike and the Lake Placid Ironman. So it's like, you want to go fucking fast and like make up time. But if you like hit a water bottle or anything on a dry day, that could be, I mean, you're going really fucking fast, like a six mile descent. You're I'm ta- like, this is like 30, 40 miles an hour or something like that. Wild. You can so die. You could fucking die. And so, and I wasn't used to that. Like I wasn't, you know, I hadn't exactly that I can recall trained in that, but like, I just, so anyway, my bike took a long time because I was very conservative on the descents, which meant 
I was making up for a lot of time on going uphill, which I told myself was fine and great because with the monsoon happening and being so fucking cold, I was like, the harder you pound up the hill, the more your blood's circulating. So that's great. Anyway, I got off the bike and um, I took a couple of steps into the tent to change into my running stuff. Cause you know, after that I had to run a marathon and I was like, I'm not going to do this. And like, everybody's tracking me and like, I'm supposed to be this, like, this, like, not hero, but like I, this image, this person, this representation of like fucking going for it. And like, you know, everyone was like rallying for me. And at that time I was still very wrapped up in like how people perceived me and like how I did. And I just remember thinking like, I can't even feel my foot. It hurts to walk. I'm going to put these shoes on. And I said like, I'm going to try to like run a mile and, I, and I'll make a call after that. And like, so I ran a mile and I, I made that and I ran two and I ran three and eventually I ran 26.2 miles and came in the finish line with like 20 minutes to spare or I wouldn't have been considered a finisher. And like for a long time, I was like, that was shitty. That was a shitty Iron Man. Like, I don't even want anyone to know about that Iron Man because it was like had to walk during the run a little bit and like. My parents like came to watch that one and they were like, we didn't know where the fuck you were. Like, we didn't know if you were okay or not. Like it was pitch black when I was finishing. Um, but I was like, I'm not going to go back to gold's gym and sit on a spin bike in front of my class and preach about suck up the discomfort and push through the blah, blah, whatever. I'm not going to like say all my shit I say and be the person who didn't finish the iron man because my foot fell asleep or because like I got rained on. Right. Yeah. Like, so that, that was a pretty humbling moment. Cause like, I just felt like I had to suck it up because I had people that like, I don't, I don't think anyone depends on me, but I, I know what I said to people and I know what I promised to them about me. And I was like, this is my reputation. And that's why I get to be a little bit fat right now and tell people to fuck off because I did that not once, but two additional times where I took three hours off my finishing time. So it's wild. That is it's it's absolutely the hardest thing. I can even a marathon itself is completely hard, but to do all of that and then just run, you're like, oh, and then it's 26.2 miles. Like it's ridiculous. I don't it know why it, it was I mean, my it was version of cocaine. I was addicted to the feeling of like putting my body through that trauma to get that like victory, to like get that right to say I did that. Like for me at that time, I needed that. Like honestly, like once I met Crispin and like my life kind of settled down, like I didn't feel the need to go after, I didn't want to take the time away from family and things anyway, but like, I just also felt like that I, I quieted in that way. Like I don't need that anymore, but I did yeah. it at the time. And so I went well, hard all the time. Was the second or third one, like I know with marathons, I've never run a marathon, but the only thing that seems enticing to me is in your, in different cities, you get to run around and see things. Is that yeah. the same for an Iron Man, or are you just oh, like totally. you're, you're not looking yeah, at you anything? See everything? You're swimming, you're running, you're biking. Like it's a great way to see. But you're sights. But you're so focused. I feel like that you're just kind of like in the moment. Whereas I mean, yeah, I guess you're you in the marathon too. Look around, like you still look around, and like I think I I really became honestly I came to love Syracuse because I trained for all of my Ironmans and marathons mostly here in Syracuse, and so you know there's there's no shortage of bodies of water to swim in and places to run or ride your bike. And so I have always said, if you want to like fall in love with 315, you run, bike and swim it because it's fucking beautiful here. There's so much to see. And I don't know that you see it when you're driving 55 to 75 miles an hour in a car everywhere that we go. Like you miss a lot of the things between the destinations. It's, it's, there's a reason why route 20 is called the scenic byway. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. So one of our buddies, uh, our close friends, Phil Martino, he, at one day at Nibsy's, we were at Nibsy's Pub, local place in Syracuse, cool uh, bar, and he committed to running a marathon, like just kind of out of the blue, like, I can't remember how it happened, but I remember like he just kind of committed to it, it was like, oh, I'll do it. And we're <laughs> like, yeah, right. Like he smoked cigarettes at the time and he was like, not, not the type of dude that was going to run a marathon. Well, he did it. He did like, I ended up doing what, like four or five of them. Um, and the one we went to watch him in Pittsburgh, he had the best time. He was playing football on the street with people and then it got better and better, but he completed it, which, you know, completing it, that's the goal. Right. But, but I, and I've never yeah. done it. So I'm like, but it's wild. And so it's a kind of a similar, like he just kind of got started and he's just like, I'm just going to do it. 
And then he did more and he loved it's it. It's very addicting. It's addicting. I mean, I'm telling you, like you, you think you're in it for like the one or two that you get sucked into. People keep trying to ask me to come back to it. And I, I, I can't like, I can't, if I didn't have kids, I would, but like, I can't yeah. see myself spending six, seven, eight hours on a Sunday, like off training. Like it's already a lot when I go teach a class on Saturday morning, you know, like, I, I, and I just, frankly, I just don't need to do that. Like, I don't, I don't need that. Yeah. I don't need that. Well, one so, thing we do need is we, we need to hear about some of your tips on throwing parties like bourbon nights. Um, because every party I've ever been to with you or that you and your awesome husband, Crispin, who's a great dude and a great friend have thrown our, our bangers. Even if like to your point, like, Oh, we're just going to go over and just have some drinks in the back porch and have a little appetizer. And all of a sudden I'm like, Oh man, this is, this is things are getting real right now. So, um, the first question I have about partying for you, you have, um, that matches your style, your colorful and loud and inclusive. What's your go-to rules on dressing up for a party? Be comfortable. Like, go with what the day is saying to go with. Like, I, I don't ever feel like I have to look a certain way or be a certain way at a party. Like, I just want to be comfortable. Um, sometimes I've got leggings on. Sometimes I've got jeans on. Sometimes my makeup's done. Sometimes my hair is up. I, I don't know. It's just be comfortable. If you're comfortable and you have, like, authentic, comfortable energy, other people will have that, too. So that's like one thing. One thing we're also, I mean, we invested a lot in the sound systems that we have in the house right now with like speakers and everything all in different areas. We are like meticulous about curating our playlists. Like when Apple like gives you a playlist or whatever and says, we think you'd like this. Like we're Crispin better than I, but he's always like thumbs up, thumbs down, love, hate, whatever. And like, it's bringing better songs in. So he's got like a chill list, a party list to like your parents are over, but you still want like cool music list and like things like that. So like, we're very much in the like, what's the ambiance like? That's why we spent a lot of time on the space and the renovation, the lighting and the sound. Just, it's all about comfortable, like being comfortable. So, I, I mean, I want to look comfortable. I want to feel comfortable. I want the environment around to be comfortable. Like you want your shoes on. I don't care. Normally wear shoes off house. You want to wear your shoes in this house and this party. I don't give a shit. That's fine with me. You want to leave the window open. You want to smoke there you want I don't care I just don't care like if it's a party it is like this is a safe space for as far as we own and have jurisdiction over you can do what you want to do and just have a great time I think our producer wore her shoes the entire time at your party I think she just she's like at this place no um yeah. that's right <laughs> feet into the couch Dave Chappelle style <laughs> look if you you can cuddle with all my blankies pet my dog I don't care you want to Touch my fish. That's fine. I don't care. We're fine. Yeah. yeah, that's the way to do it because then, then everyone's like, the worst is when you go to a party, and honestly, I don't like taking my, I, I like taking my shoes off that people want me to, but like, you just feel so relaxed when your shoes are off. It's kind of weird walking around in your socks, um, but like, if you feel like you can't go in certain areas, or you're just like, or they're like weird about you, like breaking things or moving things around. Like it just is not fun to hang out. Yeah. Agreed. Our, I mean, you know, this Alex, like having young children, it's like, you can't break shit more than my children can break it. Yes. I mean, maybe you can fueled with pure 124 proof bourbon break shit more than my kids. But like, I don't know, just, just my son's energy right now. when he walks through my house with his shoes on or off, he forgets to take them off. It's the whole thing, but he has like no spatial awareness. He just like around the house, just like, I don't oh, yeah. like he breaks things all the fucking time. So I'm like, if I, I, I can live with that with my son, I can certainly live with that with like my party guests, you know, yeah. my yeah. girls walk in and it's like socks are everywhere. Just like why bag, right? everything. It's just like a free for all. Yeah. So kind of like true. Matt's Matt's house. He Matt pulls his socks off the second he walks in and just tosses them. I mean, I, I have, I have though, and I'm sure both of you have, well, but maybe not now with your kids, but there's been multiple times where I wake up and like, there's a trail of clothes from my front door to the bedroom. You know what I mean? <laughs> like shoo, shoo, you know, as you go up there. So, so good so to know what? your sex life is still intact there, Matt. <laughs> I was talking about coming home drunk and just getting all I know. up in there. But, I know, I know. But, so but yeah, one like, time, one time when Matt, uh, this was a long time ago. I don't know what we were doing, but we were out drinking and we came back to my house, me, him and April, my wife. And I, Matt was, 
I don't I don't know. We were all pretty drunk, but all I know is I woke up in the morning and that Matt's shoe was outside. Um in the like in the garden. Yeah, in the bushes in the garden. And then we all had that same moment. We remember Matt fell into the garden and we couldn't get him out of there. <laughs> we're like, yeah, get up. And then we're like, why is his shoe there? Like, oh yeah. He he left it there. Well, right the there. And in we go. Yeah. One one time um Stephanie and I and our friend Mike Almeida and um a couple of people were coming back and we had locked ourselves out of the house and um, we were going to like drink and like hang out uh, late night. So the next day, like Mike's gone and um, our other friends were gone. So I'm like, oh, cool. I'm cleaning up. And, you know, it's like nine in the morning. I'm walking around and I walk outside and I remember that we had locked. We were locked out. And I kind of then now I'm remembering how we got back in because I, I hadn't blacked out from it. I kind of forgot about it. And there in the center of our house was the, um, air, we, at the time we had an air conditioning unit that was on the ground. And there was one high heel shoe stuck in the grass. <laughs> out. So we had taken the air conditioner <laughs> out and then boosted Stephanie up and her, one of her shoes fell off as we went in there for her to come and let us in. That's the only way in. You had to. Yeah, they had to do it. And um, see, AI could never recreate that story. It would not know how to put details like that into a story. Yeah, no, yeah. it would just be like very chill. It'd be like they needed to get in their house. So they took their air conditioning out and then they went to sleep. But what yeah. about the shoe? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the shoe, the shoe is a fun little extra detail, you know? I, mm -hmm. I, I love the aspect of it. Um, I, that's something that in hindsight, there's so many small things that I think about, like, because we, we're trying to work on a cookbook and there's cool, like, images that I think would be cool. Like having a picture of just the high heel laying on the grass. Um, out of context, people going through. I'd love to see people reading the book because I like seeing pictures being like, I wonder what the story was behind that and never knowing it, but knowing there's a cool story. I love that. And I try to integrate that into as many presentations in the business setting as I possibly can. I'm sorry, but if you're like a CMO working at a B2B financial something or other, and like all of a sudden I gave you a slide with a high heel in the grass, <laughs> you're going to pay attention to what I have to say next because you're going to want to know what the fuck that shoe is there. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Make it work. Next slide. I will, I'll do that. But like, that's, that's where I'm at. That's my, that's my shit. Okay. Ready for some, uh, okay. So this is the next section is called the lightning round. We're going to give you this or that. And we want a quick, we want an answer and why. Okay. okay. Let's go. First question, two thousands or nineties hip hop. What's bumping at your party? Nineties. Okay. Nin do you want to 90s know why? is definitely better. I do want to know why, um, but 2000s is pretty great too. It is great, but 90s, I'm going to get more of some more like run and DNC kind of shit that I like. Like, I think that's more my era there. Montel Jordan. Yeah, let's go. I love a good Montel Jordan. I do too. I do too. <laughs> Um, okay, that's a good answer. I mean, that, that's a, that, I mean, I don't know that you're going to get a wrong answer out of that, but I, I do have, yeah. it, it depends on my mood. Like sometimes I might be in the one or the other. And, and someone in your household has a big thing for Nelly. So I feel like you playing the 2000s a little bit more. Yeah. You know what though? Actually, I, cause I would have said nineties yesterday and the day I was having, but today I was driving, um, uh, after our meeting out this morning, I was feeling good. We had a good conversation and been ready for stuff. And all of a sudden, Air Force Ones, the very beginning with the bass start, I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great song. Um, okay, so, Lisa, how about this? Would you rather have a really hard-to-find, very snobby, limited-edition bourbon, to you said earlier, caught in a back alley with some different deals, or a very special vintage bottle of wine? I'm going to go with the wine only because the abundance of bourbon that's in my house right now, I don't, I don't know how long it will take me to get through all of the different unique bourbon experiences that Mr. Dole Bear has brought to bear here. So I will go with wine. He's a true curator. That's a great answer. He's got so much shit here. Okay, so this one's not a this or that, but it's close. So if you're if you're in a tri uh, triathlon, and I don't know if this is called a triathlon, more like a relay, I guess would be the, would be the term. You had to pick two famous people, celebrities, any well-known people to be your partners in it. Who would you pick and what part would they do? Okay, so I'm picking two people. I'm going to assume it's a triathlon since it's three roles and I would have one. Yes. All right. I will take care of the running. I would like 
Matthew McConaughey to swim. And I would like okay. him to do it without a wetsuit with a Speedo, please. Like and, that movie where the treasure hunters, he was like swimming in that movie the whole time. Yeah. I'm going to film him as he comes out and just the Speedo after that swim. Okay. So he's doing that. I'm going to take care of the run for the bike. I would like to please have. Hmm. Can I have Jason Momoa just for, again, yeah. this is just, this is me creating my own sexual fantasy triathlon circus. <laughs> is that okay? He yeah. feels like he'd be big for a bike. Like he feels like that's he'd be why like, I want him to do it. Like, <laughs> I want to watch him. Like, yeah, <laughs> I think that, that that's something we should check. We should see where we can Google that. Like sexy triathlon circus. I think there might be. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a cool band too. Yeah. Um, speaking of bands, I've got one for you, and this one are based on knowing you and your interests. So you can only pick one of these. You can either go have one day shopping with Lady Gaga. Or, or you can be the opening stand-up act for Dave Chappelle's next show. Oh my God, Matt, Matt. All right. Um, I'm going to pick the Dave Chappelle one because it scares me more and I just fucking love him. And to have a venue and a, an opportunity to be seen for comedy before somebody like that like the audience that would be there that's worth way more than like picking up some bangles and baubles with gaga love you gaga but i would have to go i'd have to bomb before i was on <laughs> before dave Chappelle went on that's what i'd have to do man i mean that sucks because lady gaga is actually waiting for you at destiny right now with a <laughs> with a gift card and um you guys are gonna eat at cheesecake factory too so can you picture lady gaga shopping at destiny like where would she go she'd be like oh I hope store. She gets shot while she's there <laughs> um, okay on the lady gaga note who's her best uh co-star tony bennett or bradley cooper and by co-star i just mean you know singing i mean her. come on man like you're they're, they're very different, but I'm going to Tony Bennett, all respect. Like, first of all, man's a fucking legend. The fact that he took a chance to pair up with Gaga, like to become relevant again, I think was fucking awesome. And the relationship that those two had and the way she respected him so much and the way he brought out her like jazz and like real, she really can sing. I think a lot of people may not still know that, that she's like a fucking true singer, artist, talent. Like she's not a fake and, um, you know, people compare her to Madonna sometimes. But, like, I love Madonna, too. Madonna can't sing like Lady Gaga, okay? Or, or write her own music. Or write her own music. Like, and I love Madonna. Like, you're, I am so, true blue, baby. Like, yeah. it's. And I like Bradley Cooper, too. But, like, whatever. Like, could Bradley, would Bradley Cooper have been as alluring in that movie if Lady Gaga wasn't his co-star? Probably not. What if no. it was Gwyneth Paltrow? She's no. saying in movies. Yeah. You know what I'm no way. Sorry. It's funny. Matt was just saying that Lady Gaga was a fake. So I, I was telling him that it's not true. He did so. not fucking say I, that. You know, I would never, ever say that. I, I actually, know you would never say that. And I will come through the screen at you, bro. You I've, I've, seen, I've seen Lady Gaga shows. I mean, she is a true, globally top level, one of the most creative people in the world. I'm a huge fan. And it's Matt's late night song with Stephanie that I've yet to see when they get home from the bar, they, they belt out Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. So. We do, we do sing shallow late night when we're, when we're home drunk, the two of us <laughs> hanging out. While the trail um, of clothes leads away from the chorus. <laughs> yeah. It's more like she, she's already Irish goodbye to me. So then I'm just like struggling to find my way back to, back to get up there. Um, okay. So, um, when we're talking about the Irish goodbye, before we wrap this up, I've had a great time with you in many different party settings. So would you rather have a day raging on like St. Patrick's Day parade day type setup or July 4th boat party banger? Ooh. Dude, I love boats, water. Okay, weather has to be good for the boat. That's what I'm gonna say. I'll do your banger party in any weather. I'll fucking kill it. But my sweet spot in life is sweaty, getting tan, very drunk, maybe inedible, on the boat, not giving a fuck with some like loud chromeo playing. 
Yeah, that's that beats it by far. I mean, St. Patty's Day, it depends on where you are. I'm sure there's, but, you know, Syracuse St. Patty's Day gets a little, you know, a little much. Boats are way better. I've had a many an amazing St. Patty's Day with Matt oh, Reed and, yeah. and you, probably yeah. you a lot before we knew each other. Um, it's been always fun. I just... Crispin would not share the sentiment with me, but I love being on a boat in the sun with music and booze. Being on a boat in the sun with music and booze to me is uh, basically heaven. Like it's if impressive. I'm going to die, like kill me here. I'll just lay here and this is where I'll be for the rest of time. It's like the Titanic before it sank. So you'd be cool with that. Just be like out in the Titanic. They were so was... covered in all that clothing and those dumb corsets. Yeah, and the they ice. were having fun. And they were they were bumping the icebergs. It wasn't sunny or anything like that at all. Yeah, like yeah, they the needed to crash in the tropics. They should have been in the Bermuda Triangle. Like they fucked that up. So yeah. it was probably pretty cold then is what you're saying. Yeah. If I, I mean, I'd rather die than be in the Bermuda Triangle then because that could be some aliens and shit too. You know what I mean? No one ever finds anything in the Bermuda Triangle. I don't fuck with the Bermuda Triangle. I'm not, I'm not gonna yeah, that. I don't either. Like, like I don't fuck with ghosts, and ghosts don't fuck with me. Like, if I know they're around, I'm just like, yo, ghosts, I'm cool, we're cool, we're all cool. So speaking Stay of cool, lanes. totally. This has been awesome, and you are anything but staying in the lane, and that's what makes you awesome. So anything you want to share with the peeps in the world before we wrap this up? Um, Only that... I'm grateful to know you both to be involved in this adventure. I am like just so proud of watching where this has gone from like the seed of an idea to like all of the different levels it's gone. And I just, I hope people see the same thing I see and like just fucking thank you for, for pulling me in that loop once in a while. It's just, it's been awesome. I mean, it's just really great. You are awesome and really great. And you're also one of our most frequent collaborators, one of the original SPAC Chicago Nation guests, one of our favorite episodes of that too. You tell a killer episode, killer story in this thing. You make everything better. So look, on behalf of Lil Alex, Lil Inspo, the great Lisa Dolbear, SPAC <laughs> Funk After Party. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here.